Cynthia and Sam were finally taking that 1400 mile road trip to Yellowstone that they've been talking about. Their three beautiful daughters have all left the nest now, so what better time was there? With one foot already out the door, they text their three girls about their impromptu adventure. The trip started with snacks and idle chit chat, and their two eldest replied almost immediately with excitement and well wishes. Their youngest, who was still in college, was most likely still asleep since it was early on a day she didn't have any classes, so back to enjoying the road. And then the hours pass, hundreds of miles behind them now, still no text. They start to reassure each other that everything was fine. They even call their daughters and they would be reminded that she's a big girl now, away from home. She's not always trying to stay in contact with mom and dad. Okay, okay, they would say, feeling just slightly better. Some more time, some more miles, and their reassurances start to become ineffective because it just wasn't like her to take this long to respond back. They call her college to do a courtesy check, and they said they would as soon as someone was available to go check and promised to call right back. Some more waiting. A thick air of anxiety sits in the car, a car that represented so much freedom. Now it felt like a rolling prison cell, waiting for the call that would set them free. They begin to enter through some mountains, and the reception began to wane and was all but gone when... The phone rings. It was the school. Relief and dread bounced against each other with anticipation of what they would hear. But what they would hear only added confusion to everything they were already feeling. The caller was muffled, words distorted by static, and the last things they were able to hear, just before the mountain swallowed the connection was, Your daughter's been found in blood. And their phone dies. Cut to black. Just like a scary movie. Except this one was real. What is going on guys, it's the Left Handed Monkey and welcome to another edition of Monkey Tales. Now, the case that we're going to delve in today is quite heartbreaking and quite senseless in its brutality. It happened to a young 20 year old artist from a small town in Texas called Italy. The population was less than 2,000 and uh, she had big talents. So that big talent would bring her to the big city but here she would encounter something quite evil and uh, that would cut her life short and leave us with an ending that at least I did not see coming and um, but before we go into it uh, hit that like button if you appreciate this content and hit that bell if you want to be notified for our weekly uploads now here is your guess the punchline why would Quasimodo make a great detective now if you guys could guess the punchline or even come up with one that's just amazing we'll pin it to the top now let's get into the case I call this one in different strokes. Meet Samantha Michelle Nance, simply known as Shelly, the youngest of three girls, the sweetest and most unassuming one. Her mom describes her as being adverse to anything that could mean trouble. You didn't have to worry about her, the definition of a homebody. No sneaking out to house parties, no alcohol, drugs, a parent's dream child. She was even more focused on her art than to boys. She was a bit indifferent towards her peers though, and in turn, they would find her a bit different also. Small in stature, but big on heart and brains, she knew she was only different because they were all the same. She let her artistic talents do the talking her senior year as she entered a contest sponsored by the Art Institute of Dallas and she won a $13,000 scholarship. So the future looked promising as she knew what she wanted to do and now she knew where she was going to do it at once that final bell rang at Italy High School. Now let's fast forward. After completing her first year at the Art Institute, the once ostracized little artist had found her community of like-minded souls. And here, even the boys began to pay her some attention because they were able to appreciate her artistic talents. And her? She kinda noticed them too now. 
She even got herself a boyfriend of sorts, a boy by the name of Nathan Shuck. Now, their relationship never really progressed past video games, going to the movies, and just touching hands, because Shelly actually was really sheltered in high school, and her mom would take blame for it. Now, she raised two other daughters completely differently, but there was something about Shelly that was so innocent and so sweet that she just wanted to protect her from the world, you know, at the cost that Shelly didn't develop socially that much. But now here she was. She's away from the comforts of home, going to a school that's nearly an hour away, living off campus with a roommate, and pretty much the freedom to navigate her future. But now we have to go to September 10th of 2009 the three hour window between 9 and 12 if you guys are a bit squeamish go ahead and fast forward Shelly was alone in her apartment that morning once her roommate left for class she was laying on her bed in her room when the front door of her apartment opened someone had let themselves in with a copy of the key with the door safely soundlessly shut behind them this person with a mind shaking with rage, distorting any rational thought, walked across the living room, stepping with confidence, knowing all too well this very apartment, and having already made sure that no one was home. Well, made sure no one was home with Shelly. Before long, the intruder was standing in front of her door, turning the knob and looking in. There was Shelly laying on her stomach, on her bed, no clue of the figure standing in her doorframe. In an instant, an unbearable weight was sitting on her back, and she was helpless. Shelly was stabbed a total of 42 times in the back and neck, until it was all over. The killer washed her blood off in the bathroom, leaving droplets and a smear on the sink, and simply left. Now, just do anything 42 times. Just flail your arms around 42 times and you guys will see how overkill this murder was. Somebody had a real deep hatred for Shelly. A small town girl from Texas without an evil bone in her body. Why? On September 11th of 2009, Shelly's own roommate Ashley was contacted to carry out that welfare check requested by the Nances. What she would find was something that would haunt everyone who worked the case. The most gruesome scene they would ever see in their lifetime, even for seasoned detectives who've seen it all. This was a hard one to take in. Now Shelly still did have on her sleeping clothes and her underwear and the medical examiner would say that he doesn't believe there was any sexual encounter, thankfully. Now no f sign of forced entry so the killer was probably someone she knew. Detectives did find something peculiar under one of Shelly's wrists. It was a blue sliver of something. They bagged it and sent it to be analyzed. And just keep it in mind, because it's going to pop up again. So, let's go on to the suspects. First on the chopping block would be the roommate, Ashley. Our feet, and she wasn't moving. So, I turned on the light and I said, Hey, Shelly, are you okay? She wasn't moving. So, I went. And I shook her in her bed. Of course, she covered up. And originally, the blanket was on her. So you shake her, put a blanket over her. Yes, sir. She don't move. She don't wake up. You pull the cover off of her, shake her again. I saw the blood, and I touched her arm, and she was cold. And I, I... As soon as you seen that, what happened? I yelled her name. I don't know how many times. Detectives began turning over different scenarios, you know, trying to find something that fit. They played the angry roommate angle, and just given Shelly, right, the passive nature, it just would not fit. They even wanted to force fit the lesbian angle, you know, because just the degree of how Shelly was murdered is something, you know, a jilted lover would do. But that just wasn't the case either. Now, of course, Ashley denied all of it and never broke from her story, but detectives really didn't like her story that much. So she was allowed to leave, but they made sure to keep her on their radar. Now, on to the actual, potentially jilted lover, the boyfriend, 
Nathan. Now, he came into the interrogation bad off already. He had scratches on his body, and his only explanation was, drum roll, please. Oh, I, uh, I usually scratch myself. Police would find an assortment of weapons in his apartment from knives, swords, daggers, ninja stars, a lot of stabby things. And these were not toys. They were real. They even found a picture of him dressed as a ninja. This kid wanted to be a ninja. With red flags up, detectives needed to talk to those closest to Nathan to build a picture of his character. Questioning his friends painted a fairly normal portrait of a college kid who happened to be shy. They also talked to his roommate Daniel, who was able to offer some information that really caught their attention. He said that Nathan was pretty much obsessed with Shelly, that he would follow her around and just spy on her, basically stalking her. Detectives recalled that Ashley had echoed a similar thing about Nathan in her interrogation and also went as far as to suggest that he wasn't actually the timid, nice kid he had made himself out to be. One of my friends was saying he's like, you know, I never really want to see Nathan angry and I asked him why and they said, have you ever seen him play a video game? He kind of just like pops if he doesn't get something. Nathan's roommate added that the day of the murder, Nathan was a bit quiet more than usual, and he noticed there were some scratches on him. Later that same day, he even came upon a blood-stained bag in Nathan's bathroom sink. Not thinking too much of it, he just went about his day. Now that bag was not news to detectives. It had been taken into evidence and sent off to be tested. If it came back as Shelley's blood, well, then Nathan had some explaining to do. During Nathan's interrogation, he was confronted about the bag and whose blood would be on it. Nathan shut down the interrogation and asked for his lawyer. A smart move in anybody's part. Just a suspicious moment to do so. But there was that nagging thing that detectives had to establish, and that was... What was the motive? Nathan seemed to really like this girl, so why would he do it? Well, it turns out, Shelley's mother would give them one in an interview and it was a motive that's as old as adam and eve she said mom i'm thinking about breaking up with nathan she said i just don't have the feelings for him that i think i should you know i just don't you know don't see the relationship going anywhere if i can't have you then no one can this revelation all the passengers were boarding the Nathan train, Daniel, Ashley, most importantly the detectives, and they were just happily rolling down the right track. That was until somebody stumbled and fell right onto those tracks. Detectives ground the Nathan train to a complete halt and looked outside to see who it was. Now, where and what you were doing on the day of the murder is something that you should expect to answer maybe three or more times. Now, Lord help you if you change anything the second time they ask you. And may the devil be kind to your soul if you adjust something a third time. Let's go back to Ashley and her alibi for that day. She claimed to be in and out of the apartment throughout the day without noticing anything odd or checking up on Shelly to see what she was up to. Remember, there were very noticeable blood spots, especially on the sink of the bathroom in which they shared, which she admitted using that day. I don't see how you can miss that big blood right here on the sink. I don't see how you can miss that. I don't see how you can miss this big deal of blood right here on the bathtub. I don't see how you can miss it all on the trash can. How do you do that? I didn't but I remember seeing the little spots of blood on the sink. When did you say that? When I was leaving for school. When? What day? Today. And you still didn't, didn't even think to knock on the door? No, sir. To say, hey, Steph, you cut yourself? You hurt? You injured? You need something? That's no. weird, ma'am. I know it is. I'm telling you everything I know. I mean... Shelly was my roommate. She was my friend. She is my friend. 
We went to school together, sir. There's no reason why I would harm her. I really believe that something terrible happened between you and Shelly that you're not telling me. And wasn't it odd not to see or hear from Shelly in this very small apartment the entire day? Well, that's not that odd. Shelly was a very private person, and not being in contact with her an entire day wasn't out of the ordinary. And those that knew her best? Well, they can see it easily happening. So let's move on to Daniel and what he was doing that day. So Daniel would say that his day was quite simple. So he went on over to Starbucks to get some coffee. Then he goes on over to White Rock Lake where he was supposed to take pictures for a class project. Now, of all the things to forget when taking pictures, he forgets the camera. So all he did instead was just go to his uh, classmate's house, hang out there for a bit, and then go directly home. And that was his story. But listen to that same story when he was asked by detectives a second time. The 1020 Starbucks. Where do you go? To White Rock Lake. Okay. Specifically at White Rock Lake. Where? Well, I went to Walmart first, then White Rock Lake. Okay. You can't leave that out. So you go straight from Starbucks to Walmart. Mm -hmm. How long? What did you do at Walmart? Um, I got a, a hair dye. Okay. Um, uh, so, what? and um, gloves to color my hair. Now this is where Satan is just rubbing his hands together because when asked a third time, included even more information. Now, most likely he was starting to feel the pressure that detectives actually knew his movements without telling him because he felt he needed to place himself in the vicinity of Shelley's murder. You get back in your car, where do you go? I went to the falls to go to my friend's house, Jessica Howard. Well, you know that classmate that he was visiting for a bit before he went home? Well, she happens to live at the falls, the same apartment complex as Shelly did. So, detectives would ask him, why didn't he share his whereabouts fully? And the response was a bit odd. He said, while he was outside, he was mugged by a black guy who stole his backpack. Now, that's a traumatic event. So basically, you omitted that, right? That's not something you just forget. And also, why didn't you share the location of your classmate? You know why, right? Everybody knows why. So detectives rub their chins. Whenever a person leaves something out of a story, Detectives will assume it's something incriminating. So let's analyze the shopping list of Daniel's first omission. The Walmart. Security footage showed that he was there, and here are the items that he was purchasing. A bar of soap, hair dye, and gloves. In context to the crime, we can view each item as having a different purpose than what they're normally used for. A bar of soap in a murder could be viewed as the anticipation of extensive body cleaning. The hair dye, though, was an odd purchase because Daniel was 28. He had a full head of hair, no grays. So what is he doing with it? Maybe it was covering up the grays from, let's say, stress. From school? Or the stress of hating someone so much you obsessed about murdering them? Then there were those latex gloves, seemingly to protect the hands when applying the hair dye, right? Well, not really, since the dye came with a set of gloves for you. So remember when I told you to keep that blue sliver in mind? Yeah, you guessed it. These gloves were blue too. Now, going back to Ashley's interrogation real quick, uh, she did tell detectives that Daniel texted her numerous times that day just idle chit chat, you know, asking her how her day was going up to a point where he would ask her if she was free for lunch. Now, Ashley would say that she had classes, she had errands to run, so she was going to be out the whole day. And that point, she said she didn't hear from him for about two hours. Okay, so why are these texts important to detectives? Well, they were starting to get the idea that what Daniel was doing was just trying to make sure that the roommate was out, that Shelly was all alone. So they took the Walmart footage and the time-stamped uh, phone logs and they would just align them to see 
Daniel's movements and when he was texting Ashley about lunch he was actually checking out the three items that he would buy at Walmart and all this happened in the three-hour window in which Shelley was murdered and that classmate that he claimed to have hung out with after White Rock Lake at the falls turns out she didn't even see him that day she wasn't even expecting him nor was there any reason for him to even be there she said now there was also the story of the fake mugging now he was supposed to have gone straight home after the mugging but police were able to ping his phone 30 minutes away from Dallas where he stayed for quite a while before coming on back home more lies so what about Nathan the motive seems solid where was he during the murder his alibi was he was at school the whole day attending classes numerous witnesses backed it and it was proven that he didn't even leave campus once until his mom picked him up at the end of the day what about the blood-stained bag on his sink results were in and the blood did belong to Shelley but who leaves evidence like that lying around a bit too convenient detectives would figure so the likely answer Daniel planted it there when he knew Nathan was down at the police station being interrogated knowing it was just a matter of time before they were in their apartments going through everything okay so at this point you should be asking yourself why the fuck did Daniel murder his roommate's girlfriend and in such a brutal manner well the answer is actually quite simple if you're a psychopath in love but he didn't love Shelley that's for sure he loved his roommate Nathan you see Daniel's gay and he was playing house with his roommate he would take Nathan to school he would make sure he was doing well in class they hung out a lot he would even make him meals throughout the day to make sure he wasn't hungry now have you ever had a roommate like that cuz I did I call her mom so somewhere along the line Nathan became Daniel's obsession when they first met Daniel told friends quote unquote that Nathan was really good looking and then he has to go and get himself a girlfriend right now they don't hang out as much anymore and that obsession well it slowly morphed into something much much darker pure hate sweet innocent Shelley adverse to trouble I mean she didn't even necessarily pick the wrong boy she just picked the boy with the wrong roommate now Shelley's mom did recall Shelley talking about Nathan's weird roommate who would get upset because he wasn't invited along on their dates that they were being rude not to do so I mean it got so awkward that Nathan would just go over to Shelly's place and hang out you know just to avoid Daniel standing in their doorway just watching them play video games watching them do whatever those close to Daniel at the time recalled him constantly complaining about Nathan and Shelly and how disrespected he would feel and it would be an anime convention that would be the final straw because poor forgotten Daniel again did not get the invite and for some reason it was all Shelley's fault now this gave detectives the motive and it was a motive as old as Adam and Steve jealousy at the trial prosecutors having dug into Daniel's past presented some troubling stories of violent tendencies there was the time Daniel had an argument with his brother instead of talking it through he grabbed a samurai sword and proceeded to destroy his brother's room afterwards he would say that he was surprised by his own actions seemingly a psychotic break from reality you know when your mind shakes with rage distorting any rational thought doesn't that happen to you he would also serve in the Navy as a pastry chef even here he felt slighted by the crew which he took to his superiors but they didn't handle it to his satisfaction so 
Eventually, even his superiors made the shit list. He expressed his anger to the naval psychologist saying that he might be tempted to use pots and pans or hot grease and knives to hurt them. He was so concerned that in the heat of the moment he wouldn't be rational that he requested his own removal from his own ship, taking himself out of the equation. Now why didn't he just take himself out of Shelley and Nathan's equation instead of taking Shelley out? Daniel's defense team really had only one path. The jealous boyfriend did it, accusing Nathan of killing Shelly because she was leaving him. They called Shelly's mother to the stand to testify, to tell the jury how Shelly confided in her about breaking up with Nathan. She did just that, but she also added that it was something Shelly thought about doing, but hadn't actually done, meaning Nathan really had no idea the relationship was about to end. So... He had no motive. Oh, and that little blue sliver that I told you to keep in mind? The labs came back, and of course it matched the model, pattern, and color of the gloves Daniel was seen buying at Walmart. Curiously, even though it was looking horrible for him, Daniel never took the stand in his own defense. And on November 4th, 2011, Daniel William was sent to okay. prison. Okay, uh, Asian guy named Daniel William needs to be explained, right? Well, it's spelled W-I-L-L-Y-A-M. He's Loatian, and he was convicted of Shelly Nance's murder, given life in prison with parole in 30 years. Her full name is Samantha Michelle Nance, named after her father Sam, who loved her to no end. Daddy's little princess. This loving father and husband has been rendered numb, no longer capable of showing emotion. He once stated, My dog died. I didn't even cry. I just dug a hole and buried him. His only strong emotion these days is that he wishes Daniel was dead. His wife Cynthia was more vocal when she gave her victim impact statement. She said, I hope you enjoy your time in jail and I hope you develop a conscience while you're there. A nice way to say that I hope not only your body will be in prison, but also your mind. Despite the evidence, Daniel claims to be innocent to this very day. And that would do it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Something simple you could do right now. If you did, just leave a thumbs up. Now, if you guys want to visit happyedition.com because you know a naked baby, please do so. That directly supports the channel. And don't forget to try your hands at the Guess the Punchline. Why would Quasimodo make a great detective? Leave it in the comments below best answer or the right answer gets pinned and i am the left-handed monkey and i will see you guys next time on monkey tales what is going on guys it's the left-handed monkey and welcome to another edition of there's a fucking racer every night look i get it your car's fast your car's cool. You spend a lot of money on it. But you're still stupid as shit. Because no one gives a fuck that you have that car. Really. No one thinks you're cool. You think you're cool. So he went to go to Starbucks, get some coffee. Then he went to... <clears throat> okay. So he went to get some coffee at Starbucks, and then he went to...